Welcome everyone um, to this e-seminar today. Um, and the focus of the discussion today is on volume management in dialysis. This e-seminar is being run on behalf of ERA EGTA by the EU Dial, the European Dialysis Working Group. To have a very distinguished um, set of panelists and speaker that I'm looking forward to listening to on a topic that touches and is very close to bedside in dialysis. And as you can see from the, the title of the session today, it will be focusing around very much around practice and clinical management and how we can improve care for our patients. Now, in order to, uh, before we sort of uh, commence, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, my speaker today. And, um, is Dr. Jennifer Fly, who um, has joined us from the US um, um, to present today as first part of the session. Dr. Fly is a nephrologist and a clinical investigator at the University of North Carolina Kidney Center, associate professor and vice chief of nephrology and hypertension at the UNC School of Medicine. She's also the director of dialysis services at the UNC hospitals in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. She completed her medical training and medical school at UNC School of Medicine, uh, training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at the Mass General Hospital. She's earned her master's in public health from the Harvard School of Public, public Health. Uh, as many of you know, she conducts patients-oriented, qualitative, epidemiologic, and prospective research aimed at improving outcomes and experiences amongst individuals with kidney disease. Jennifer has made a major impact on our understanding of fluid balance in dialysis patients over the last few years. And today she's gonna to give us a talk on the clinical perspectives on volume management in dialysis. Welcome, Dr. Fly. Before you start, Dr. Fly, I just want to mention one point to the audience that you'd be able to earn one European credit for continuous medical education as being part of the ERA EDTA membership is an exclusive benefit being offered to the members. Thank you, we are ready to go. Great, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I just wanna confirm that you can see my screen. I'll take yes. that as a yes. yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, as required, I have some uh, disclosures. So I'll be speaking about volume management for the next 30 or 35 minutes. And to start, we'll review the conundrum that we face as clinicians when we're managing volume on hemodialysis. Um, but then we'll turn quickly to actually think about some practical approaches that we can implement when we're seeing patients. And I've broken it down into three areas, um, minimizing ultrafiltration rates by reducing fluid gains via a number of strategies. Uh, how we can assess and monitor volume status, and then how we might be able to more safely challenge volume status in our patients that we think that are volume overloaded. For the most part, I'll be focusing on, on uh, evidence around end center hemodialysis, um, but many of the concepts apply to other modalities. But first, this conundrum. So when we manage volume, we're trying to strike a balance between the risk of overly rapid fluid removal and the downstream consequences of that, whether it be hypotension, access thrombosis, certainly the patient-centered outcomes of cramping and fatigue that can occur from too rapid a fluid removal. And then in more recent years, we've come to understand some actual pathologic damage, such as end-organ ischemia, um, well known to the heart, but also present in the liver, the gut, the brain, and other organs, um, and even the kidneys, where we see faster loss of residual kidney function when we're too aggressive with our fluid removal. But we're trying to balance those risks with, on the other end, of the spectrum, um, leaving patients' volume expanded. And we also know that that has adverse downstream consequences. Hypertension, again, the patient-centered uh, outcomes of edema, dyspnea, fatigue. But then over time, if our patients are volume expanded, we worry about associated cardiac remodeling. And again, the downstream consequences of heart failure, arrhythmia, and even death. Um, so in practice, um, we, we know these things, um, we know that we're trying to do this, but it's actually much harder um, than oftentimes that than we would expect it to be to do these things. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those reasons. 
Um, but oftentimes when we're trying to strike this balance, and I alluded to this, it's really our patients that suffer the consequences. Um, this is some um, quotes from patients that I actually took care of uh, from a qualitative study we did a number of years ago. And when we were talking with patients about their experience with volume, one 55 year old woman said to us, as soon as the cramps start, I'm yelling. You never die, but it's so painful that you think you do. So can you imagine showing up for a treatment that is supposedly uh, saving your life, um, but you feel like you die every time you come in the door? I mean, no wonder, particularly in the United States that our patients don't wanna stay on treatment or often skip treatments. But then on the other end of the spectrum, a 76 year old woman said to us, I just kind of panic when I can't get a deep breath. It's like, I feel like I'm going to smother. And so as I go through some of the evidence, we talk through some of the strategies, it's really these experiences that we're trying to impact in our clinical management. So what we seek when we're managing volume is reducing ultrafiltration rates or ultrafiltration rate minimization without volume expansion. And again, easier said than done. So a couple of years ago, there was a KDGO controversies conference on blood pressure and volume management and dialysis. And what the attendees concluded was that volume management really needed to be individualized in order to strike this balance. Specifically, the manuscript quoted, managing blood pressure and volume and dialysis requires an individualized approach with integration of numerous clinical dialysis treatment and patient factors. Um, so given the relatively paucity of high level or high quality uh, data in this field, how do we actually operationalize this in practice? So we'll look at a few approaches now. So as I said, we're gonna divide this into three categories. The first of which is trying to minimize ultrafiltration rates by reducing fluid gains. So we can do this in two ways. We can decrease the amount going in the patient, typically done through dietary or dialysate sodium reduction, or we can increase the amount going out of the patient, which is typically done by diuretics. We'll also talk about how to assess and monitor volume status and understanding that people have access to different levels of technology and devices. Um, we'll consider this when in the presence of objective measures such as ultrasound and bioimpedance, but we'll also consider how we might assess and monitor volume status when we don't have access to these tools. And finally, we'll talk about um, some ways that we might be able to safely challenge volume status. When we're trying to lower uh, ultrafiltration rates, there are really two ways that we can go about this. Um, we can either extend the treatment time or we can decrease the amount of fluid that we're taking off. Um, given that the average session length in Europe is quite a bit longer than it is in the United States, I'm going to skip talking about treatment time extension. Um, but know that this can be accomplished even in the setting of the slightly longer treatment times that you all already have with thrice weekly dialysis um, by converting patients to nocturnal or more frequent dialysis, or certainly um, in patients who are particularly difficult to alter filter considering home therapies. But for the purposes of this talk, we're really gonna focus up here on the numerator um, in ways that we can decrease the amount of interdialytic weight gain. Um, because we don't wanna decrease the ultrafiltration volume unless the weight gain has actually been decreased. Otherwise, we'll see that our, our patients have become volume expanded over time. Um, and what I can tell you has happened in the United States is there's been increasing focus on ultrafiltration rates is people have decreased that ultrafiltration volume because they wanna keep the ultrafiltration rates less than 13 mils per hour per kg, but they're doing so at the expense of leaving patients volume expanded. And that's what I, I, we want to avoid. And so we're really looking at trying to decrease the amount of weight gain. So the most common way um, to lower interdialytic weight gain um, tends to be through fluid restrictions. So what do we know about interdialytic weight gain trends um, in Europe over the last number of years? And what we've seen is that there has actually been a slight decline in interdialytic weight gain, whether you're looking at the relative interdialytic weight gain as a percent of post-dialysis weights, or more at the facility level when you're considering the proportion of patients by relative interdialytic weight gain. So over the last four phases of DOPS, you can see that there's been a slow um, decrease in the amount of interdialytic weight gain at the facility level um, in Europe. So as I said, the most common way to lower interdialytic weight gain is through fluid restrictions. However, from the patient perspective, fluid restrictions can be really difficult. 
These are data um, from a large uh, systematic review of 46 studies over 800 patients. And they reviewed the qualitative studies about how patients felt about dietary restrictions and fluid management. Um, and some of the these are some of the uh, fluid related quotations from the patients. One patient said, if I'm gonna live thirsty, I don't wanna live. People will think we are very poor and cannot afford salt. They will think we are starving and have no money. That was from a, a patient in, in Australia where uh, salt was equated uh, with uh, kind of financial status. And a third patient said, I feel cross where I am because I can't live my normal life like I used to. I can't just drink whatever I want when I want to. And so the systematic review concluded that dietary and fluid restrictions are disorienting and an intense burden for patients with kidney disease. And as we'll see, um, I do not think that they are impossible, and I actually do believe that we should be trying to fluid restrict our patients. Um, however, the way to do this is really to talk about sodium or salt and not about fluid. And what I would suggest to you that it is actually virtually impossible to fluid restrict a patient who is oversalted and has access to water. And as we'll talk about in a couple of slides when we turn to think about dialysate sodium, there are a number of things that we do to our patients to give them excess sodium, whether it's via the dialysate, whether it's through giving them antibiotics that are loaded in normal saline, or through all the little no normal saline boluses that they may get during dialysis treatments. Um, so again, understanding that when we're talking to our patients about trying to reduce their fluid gains, we don't wanna talk about fluid, we really wanna talk about um, their sodium intake. Now we've said that dietary restrictions can be difficult for patients, but I don't think that they are impossible. This is data from um, some advanced chronic kidney disease patients. This was a crossover trial uh, where close to 60 patients crossed over between a salt restricted diet and a usual diet. And in this particular case, uh, the salt restriction was taught via motivational interviewing. And what they found um, was that when the patients were on a salt-restricted diet, patients had uh, lower blood pressure, um, and they also had uh, lower, uh, lower weights, um, suggesting that they were less volume expanded. So again, with appropriate salt restriction, you can get reduction um, in fluid retention. So that's a dietary sodium. Um, but as we said, exogenous, exogenous sodium comes into our patient systems via a number of mechanisms, um, not the least of which is uh, through dialysate sodium, which we prescribe. So small prospective studies over the years have shown that lowering the dialysate sodium pretty definitively decreases blood pressures and it can lower interdialytic weight gain. And so as a result of that data, and again, um, in the corresponding time, having this increased focus on fluid management, there has been a general decline really across the world in um, the dialysate sodium that's prescribed to patients. Um, there's been a particularly large downward trend in the United States from an average of 140 to an average of 137.8, um, but also about a point drop in Europe. The other thing that's happened is um, we've gone from it being more likely to standardize the dialysate sodium at the facility level um, to having that become slightly less common and so using a little bit more individualized dialysate sodium. So on the surface, based on what I said about using a lower dialysate sodium um, being associated with lower blood pressures and lower interdialytic weight gain, it makes sense that we've seen these trends and you might assume that this is a good thing but we've been talking about intermediate outcomes. We haven't talked about whether or not decreasing dialysate sodium actually impacts the hard outcomes like cardiovascular outcomes. So last year uh, in 2020, the SOLID trial, which was kind of a much awaited trial uh, in dialysis was published uh, in JSON. And in this trial, which was uh, really small, um, they randomized 49 patients to a dialysate sodium of 135 and 50 patients to a dialysate sodium of 140. And their primary outcome was a change in left ventricular mass index. And there was no significant change in this, um, but they did, as had been seen in other studies, uh, see a drop in interdialytic weight gain, as well as a decrease in markers of volume expansion, such as BNP. But interestingly, they also saw a significant increased risk of intradialytic hypotension. 
Um, so is it possible that using the lower dialysate sodium, which would mean that it, you were having less fluid pulled into the intravascular space, in some patients, could this actually be a harmful approach? And in fact, this was consistent with a Cochrane meta-analysis uh, that was published just pre-solid, so it did not include the 100 patients that were uh, in, in the solid trial. And what they found was that in patients who were dialyzed against a dialysate sodium less than 138 versus a higher dialysate sodium, um, that those patients did have a higher risk of hypotension. Um, and this should say, I'm sorry, with a lower dialysate sodium. So again, raising the question of while theoretically it would make sense that a lower dialysate sodium helps with volume expansion, that in some patients it may have the untoward effect of causing hemodynamic instability. So I think at this point, the story on dialysate sodium is this. We know that lower dialysate sodium is probably better for fluid status. Um, but a dialysate sodium less than 136 seems to pretty solidly associate with hypotension and cramping. So what I would argue is that the optimal dialysate sodium is unknown, and probably the optimal dialysate sodium is different depending on the patient characteristics. There is an ongoing trial that's much larger than SOLID. It's called the RESOLVE trial. It's a cluster randomized trial of over 400 clinics. And they're comparing a dialysate sodium of 137 versus 140, which at least in my mind is probably a more uh, clinically relevant comparison than the 135 versus 140 that was looked at in SOLID. 137 is a, a much more common concentration used in the United States now. So what I would suggest is that lower dialysate sodium is reasonable in patients who have volume overload, who don't have significant comorbidities, particularly heart failure, um, that would increase their risk for adverse events. So patients that have, are routinely hypertensive and rarely have intradialytic hypotension, and you know their volume expanded, lowering the dialysate sodium is probably reasonable. Um, I do not tend to go below 137, except in the setting of in, in very acute cases. So that's how we might be able to decrease the amount of fluid coming in so we can lower our ultrafiltration volumes. What about diuretics? What about increasing the amount that's going out? Um, so practice patterns regarding diuretics, particularly in hemodialysis, vary substantially across the world. So pretty much in most countries, uh, close to 50% of patients with advanced CKD and patients that are on peritoneal dialysis receive diuretics. However, in the United States, more than 50% of hemodialysis patients stop diuretics after dialysis initiation. And I can tell you from looking at data from hundreds of thousands of patients at this point, that this decision to stop diuretics after hemodialysis initiation does not seem to have any rhyme or reason and does not necessarily correlate with uh, their amount of residual kidney function. It seems to be more of a practice pattern um, of individual nephrologist. And in fact, um, fewer than a quarter of US dialysis patients remain on diuretics six months after hemodialysis initiation. Now, I appreciate that in Europe that this is very different and that many patients with residual kidney function remain on diuretics and they do so at much higher doses than are in the United States. So this may very well be a practice that you all are um, quite used to putting in place. But surprisingly, despite um, the fact that we use diuretics routinely in peritoneal dialysis patients, the evidence base around diuretics in hemodialysis patients is surprisingly weak. There's a couple of observational studies um, that have looked at outcomes among patients who are on diuretics versus those that are not. But I can tell you that looking at uh, diuretics and observational data is really difficult because we usually have quite inaccurate data on patients' residual kidney function, which is a, a huge confounder in this particular question. Um, so this was a study that we published a couple of years ago where we were trying to get around this issue. And so we looked at 12,000 patients that in the United States had Medicare prior to starting dialysis. And what that meant is that we were able to access the insurance claims of patients before they started on dialysis. So we looked at 12,000 patients who were all prescribed a loop diuretic before they started dialysis. And then we asked the question, when they started dialysis, what happened to those patients who stayed on the diuretic versus those that stopped the diuretic? And as I already said, this tended seems to be a bit of a natural experiment because it doesn't always correlate with their clinical status. 
And what we found was that group of patients that remained on the diuretic in the year following um, hemodialysis initiation, that those patients had a slightly lower uh, rate of hospitalization, a little bit less intradialytic hypotension, and slightly less interdialytic weight gains, although the clinical significance of this is, is marginal. Um, the mortality effect did not reach statistical significance, but this was a relatively small sample at 12,000 patients. But this just gives some suggestion that using loop diuretics in hemodialysis patients, again, as you all are um, well, well equipped and already doing, may be helpful. Um, we're actually doing a pilot study of this now. It'll finish up in the next six weeks where we have been using higher doses of, of furosemide than is typically used, at least in the, in the United States. Again, uh, not doses that, that they still pale in comparison to some of the European doses, um, but we are trying to fill a little bit of this evidence gap now. Okay, so that is about decreasing um, the amount of fluid going in. But the other, in, in an effort to decrease uh, the ultrafiltration rates that we expose our patients to. But what about this issue of assessing and monitoring volume status? And I would say that um, this may have actually overtaken vascular access as the Achilles heel in uh, dialysis. This is one of the most vexing and I think frustrating aspects of clinical practice. And that was underscored by the, the few questions that have already been submitted to the seminar and that people are asking about, about volume assessment. So when we are assessing volume on dialysis, we are trying to estimate the amount of volume in the extracellular volume. So the amount of fluid in the interstitial volume and the plasma volume. And unfortunately, blood pressure is not, an ex is not a good measure of extracellular volume status. Um, so this was a study um, that looked at bioimpedance in 500 European patients. And what they found um, was that about 15% of patients were hypertensive and actually hypervolemic by bioimpedance. Um, but there were 10% of the patients that had a normal blood pressure, but were still hypervolemic by bioimpedance. And then another 13% who were hypertensive, but they appear to be, um, have good volume status. Um, so we cannot assume that a patient that has normotension, that that equates with euvolemia, but we also can't assume that hypertension necessarily equates with hypervolemia. Other data tell us that physical exam, at least on its own, is also not a particularly good surrogate for volume status. But reassuringly, um, there has been increasing uh, interest in using technology in this space. Ultrasound is certainly an increasingly common tool used for measuring volume status um, outside of the nephrology space, common in disciplines like heart failure and critical care. There are a number of different methods that you can use ultrasound uh, to estimate volume status. You can measure the inferior vena cava collapse, carotid artery, uh, artery ultrasound, and then I think the most promising and likely the most used at this point is lung ultrasound, um, where you can measure um, lung comets, but you can also measure um, A and B lines. Advantages of lung ultrasound, it correlates well with other objective measures like bioimpedance. It's non-invasive, um, but it is very operator dependent and there's really no standardization. And in fact, there are um, varying ways that you can read, ultra, read the lung ultrasounds um, depending on uh, how detailed you wanna be. And then certainly the operators require training. So while I think that this can be feasibly incorporated into practice, it is, it is not something that unless you have a trained operator that you can just start in your dialysis clinic. So what about bioimpedance? Um, so we don't have time today to cover sort of the details of the different types of bioimpedance. Um, but what I'll say is that bioimpedance can be calculated by either total body or segmental measurements and by single or multiple frequencies. And then the data can also be interpreted in a number of ways. You'll see vector plots, you'll see a ratio of extracellular water to total body water. Um, if you were using, um, for Fresenius's device, they have an overhydration index. Um, and what that does is it tries to separate out the lean tissue, the adipose tissue, and then leave you with the excess fluid as an estimation of the volume status of the patient. But the challenge with bio bioimpedance is it does not differentiate the extracellular water that's in the plasma from the extracellular water that's in the extravascular or the interstitial compartment. Um, 
So what that means is it doesn't tell us how much of the fluid is actually accessible with ultrafiltration. It may give us an idea of the overall volume status, but in the moment that may not tell us um, how much fluid we can safely remove. So there has been one meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials of bioimpedance to date that did show that using bioimpedance um, with some frequency in practice appeared to um, be associated with lower blood pressure, um, but the association was not significant with all-cause mortality. Um, however, the caution that I will give you is that the studies in this particular meta-analysis were small. There was a huge amount of heterogeneity across the studies, um, and I would just say that our evidence base at this point is, is on the smaller side, and it's unclear at this point whether or not um, using bioimpedance routinely can affect kind of the larger, uh, the long-term outcomes of cardiovascular mortality. Um, but I think there's certainly some signs that it may be a helpful tool in doing so. There has been one recent study that compared uh, the measurement of extracellular volume across these different approaches. And specifically, it was with 53 hemodialysis patients in Greece, and they compared measurements of bioimpedance, lung ultrasound, the blood volume monitor, or the CRIT line, which is the, the CL on this slide, um, versus an IVC diameter, which was the gold standard. Um, and what they found was that lung ultrasound actually had the strongest predictive capacity of both over and under hydration. Um, and at this point, I would say it's unclear to the best approach uh, across these three, and really the choice is based on availability and also operator experience within each clinic. But ultimately, in clinical practice, we often don't have access to these objective measures of volume status, yet we're held to the same clinical standards of estimating volume status in our patients. So how do we go about that when we don't have lung ultrasound, we don't have bioimpedance, or we don't have blood volume monitors? And what I would argue is that we're not completely in the dark. You know, while the physical exam on its own is not necessarily predictive of volume status, um, the physical exam coupled with longitudinal trends in blood pressure, ultrafiltration tolerance, um, and a number of other factors actually can be quite helpful. Um, and there's also evidence to suggest that just close vigilance while we're taking care of our patients and monitoring weights uh, may be useful. This was a study um, that we did a number of years ago where we looked at the association of um, patients who finished their dialysis treatments above their prescribed dry weight. And in this case, we were looking at patients who finished their dialysis treatment, so their post-dialysis weight was just about a kilo above what their prescribed dry weight was. And what we found was that there was a pretty strong association um, of when patients miss their target weight. And in fact, the more frequently that they miss their target weight, i.e. that they were at least a kilo above their target weight when they finished dialysis, um, that those patients had a much higher risk of 30-day death. So the more frequent these target weight misses were, the higher the 30-day death risk. So in this cohort, which was over 100,000 patients, we looked at the 44,000 that had hospitalizations. And in this part, in this subset, we asked the question, when these patients were discharged from the hospital, when they went back to their dialysis clinic, did their target weight change? We had no information on their volume status, so I have no idea if the target weight should have been changed or if it should have been left the same. But what we found was that there, any kind of target weight adjustment after a hospitalization, that those patients were less likely um, to have um, an emergency department visit, another hospitalization, or a composite of an emergency department visit death or hospitalization in the next 30 days. So what this suggests um, is that changing the target weight was probably just a surrogate for clinical vigilance. People were paying attention. The patient had a change in clinical status, um, and then they followed up by changing their target weight. Um, so this just gets at that if we're monitoring weights more frequently, we may be able to pick up trends. And this can be done in clinics with um, a person like a fluid manager in the United States. If there is a fluid manager, it may be a social worker, it may be a dietitian. Sometimes it's just a particularly interested nurse. And what you can do is just track at your clinic level patients who over a month period have not been achieving their target weight and use that as a way to identify patients who may be getting into trouble uh, with their volume status. 
again, in clinics, particularly in Europe, where um, you have nephrologists in the clinic, I do think that there's a lot more oversight in this. What I can tell you in looking at data in the United States, sort of at the population level, oftentimes patients will go six to eight months and no one will have touched their target weight. And so this is just a way to get people to focus in. And again, using um, these missed target weights as a way to identify patients that may need some kind of clinical attention. So when you identify such in a patient, you wanna assess the reasons. Is it because we're ultra filtering them too much? Is it because the patients are symptomatic, they're cramping and so they're signing off early or their ultra filtration is being turned down? Or if they had a change in clinical status, do they have new heart failure? Do they need an echo? Do they need a target weight adjustment? It just gives you the opportunity to pause and see if you can change management. Okay, so for the third um, area of volume management that we're going to talk about, we will talk about how we can safely challenge volume status. So prospective data suggests that probing target weight can improve volume status. These are data from the DRIP trial, which used blood volume monitors um, to slowly, in a protocolized way, challenge target weights. Um, but we know that we have, and we know that that will actually reduce blood pressures. But the flip of that is we also know that it can cause intradilytic hypotension. And for many years, we presumed that patients had to be crashing, they had to be someone you're throwing into Trendelenburg to really be um, experiencing harm from intradilytic hypotension. But increasingly, from both echo data and other imaging data, as well as some observational data, we appreciate that patients are probably having um, some long-term harm associated with just slightly lowering blood pressures. And so we can't just, um, we, we can't just challenge, challenge target weights without watching blood pressure. Um, this is data from a study that we did a number of years ago that found patients that frequently, in more than 30% of their treatments, who had blood pressures less than 90 millimeters of mercury, that um, that particular definition of intradilytic hypotension associated with increased all-cause mortality. And we looked in this particular study, we looked at a range of definitions of intradilytic hypotension, and this was actually the only one that was significantly associated with mortality. So adding symptoms or adding interventions like turning off the ultrafiltration rate or giving a saline bolus didn't, um, didn't change the association of the definitions. So how can we go about this? How can we challenge fluid status um, without the flip of the harms? So as we said at the beginning of the presentation, an obvious way to do this is to increase treatment length. You can certainly do this for all treatments. Um, you can also do it for a time-limited period. So oftentimes people will talk about time-limited trials of dialysis. You can do a time-limited period. If you think that a patient is really volume expanded and you wanna challenge their target weight, but you know that in order to do that, you would be exposing them to a higher ultrafiltration rate than you would want to. In those patients, you may say, well, for a month, let's extend your dialysis treatment by 30 minutes or an hour and see if we can get your volume status down and then return to their prior treatment time. Another strategy that we've used in my practice is to um, selectively increase treatment times um, with the, most, the easiest time to do it being the treatment after the long break because most patients have their largest interdialytic weight gains after the 72 hour break in the setting of a thrice weekly paradigm. And so in some patients, we have them on a longer treatment on that Monday or Tuesday of the week. So we can have slightly lower ultrafiltration rates um, when they're gonna have a higher, higher interdialytic weight gain. Um, and again, in a constrained facility practice, this can be quite effective. And it also, the patients like it because they know that it's just one treatment where they're gonna have a longer treatment. You can certainly add extra treatment so you don't have to use as high of an ultrafiltration fil rate. And then the other three strategies we'll look at a little bit of data on. So one is decreasing the dialysate temperature. The other is either using sodium or ultrafiltration profiling or a combination of the two. But what I'll tell you is that for the most part, sodium profiling is, is fallen largely out of favor because of the associated sodium loading that occurs with it. And most patients, sodium profiling is quite effective in your ability to pull the fluid off, um, but then the patient just leaves and is very thirsty because you've given them a lot of salt and they drink it right back. Um, so we'll look at some data specifically for UF profiling. And then finally, you can use tool-guided target weight reduction. So that's using things like bioimpedance and lung ultrasound.
So what about cool dialysate? Um, there is a large trial of this going on kind of at the pragmatic level in Canada now, but this was some of their pilot data. Among 70 patients, they found that cooling the dialysate to 0.5 degrees Celsius below body temperature versus 70, 37 degrees improved a number of um, cardiovascular measures. There was no change in left ventricular ejection fracture, but there was a decrease in LV mass and a number of, of other cardiovascular measures. Um, and also with functional imaging of the brain, there does appear to be a decrease in some of the white matter changes that you can see with hemodialysis when you cool the dialysate. So I think cooling the dialysate um, to a level of about 36.5 or even 36 is very well tolerated in most patients. And I really don't have a reason not to do that in almost all patients. Now, what about ultrafiltration profiling? So again, this is going to be independent of sodium profiling. This was a study that we did a couple of years ago where we looked at 32 maintenance hemodialysis patients. This was a crossover study. So the patients received 18 ultrafiltration profile treatments versus 18 conventional hemodialysis treatments where the ultrafiltration was constant across the treatment. Um, we used a profile two on a Fresenius machine, which was just a down sloping um, UF rate over the course of the treatment. Um, we did do intradialytic echoes and a number of measures of cardiac function, and we found no difference in hypotension, um, troponin T change, or cardiac echo parameters. Um, subjectively, some of the patients appeared to respond to ultrafiltration profiling, um, but at the level of our outcomes, we saw no difference. Now, what about tool guided ultrafiltration? So there have been some studies to suggest that lung ultrasound guided ultrafiltration can improve ambulatory blood pressure. And also studies to suggest that bioimpedance guided ultrafiltration can improve um, not only uh, fluid status, but also perhaps mortality. So what are the guidelines? Those are a number of the strategies. Um, they're increasingly, we're seeing a little bit more at the guideline level, all of, what, all of it with uh, not so great evidence levels, um, but these are guidelines from the Renal Association published in 2019 around fluid assessment and management. And what they recommend is clinical assessment of the fluid status at least monthly for most patients or most stable patients, and that when possible to supplement clinical assessment of fluid status with objective measures to use a dialysate temperature of less than or equal to 36 degrees Celsius. And as we've been talking about, to try to avoid excessive ultrafiltration rates by addressing fluid gains, accepting staged achievement of target weight, i.e. you're not going to get there in one treatment, um, or using an augmented schedule like extra treatments or longer sessions. So in conclusion, what I've told you is that higher ultrafiltration rates and extracellular volume expansion um, you know, on different ends of the spectrum are both associated with adverse outcomes. But the state of the evidence today is, is that we think that both UF rate minimization and euvolemia are important, and we really don't know their relative importance. And honestly, if I have to choose one, I shoot for euvolemia more so than I shoot for UF rate minimization. Um, and I've given you some strategies that have hopefully exemplified that volume management plans should be individualized and that we have a number of tools um, at our, our fingertips, including our understanding of the patient's risk profile, their historical blood pressure and weight trends, symptoms they may experience during treatment. And then in some cases, we do have objective volume at, um, measurement tools that may be helpful in conjunction with all of these other uh, clinical aspects. And so with that, I believe that we're happy to take some questions for the panel that can be submitted uh, via the Zoom Q&A function. Thank you very much, Jennifer. A brilliant talk summarizing some really sort of current understanding of the clinical topics, but also some of the controversies and the conundrums that lie ahead of us to try and solve in managing fluid balance. A um, lot of food for thought there, but I just, just wanted to now introduce the panelists to yourselves. As Jennifer has mentioned, please use the Q&A function to pose questions to uh, distinguish three panel members I've got today. Uh, aside from Jennifer, I've got um, Dr. Frank van der Sande from the Academic Hospital um, uh, in Maastricht. And of course, Dr. Um, uh, Professor Mehmet Kanbe, nephrologist from, um, um, the, the, uh, from Istanbul. Um, both of them are um, active board members of the UDL organization. Uh, as you may know, it works towards improving practice in hemodialysis, including research. Um, and so it's, it's a delight to have you both on the panel as well. 
So the question is really to three of our panelists from the audience. Whilst you're thinking, and I'm really sort of congratulating you, you all on the great turnout, whilst you're thinking on the question, let me pose a, a few questions to, to, to my panel members here. Um, maybe I should start with Frank. Uh, Frank, um, our first question that has come from the audience is, could you give us a view on how to calculate dry weight um, accurately based on some of the evidence we've heard today? Yeah, thank you, uh, Sandeep. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, you, you show some wonderful slides, uh, and still, uh, you suggest it's very difficult to optimize uh, dry weight because we don't know exactly what is dry weight. Uh, is this the lower blood pressure to achieve uh, without uh, lower dry weight to achieve without any complications? Uh, with a beautiful blood pressure. Uh, uh, but but there, there, of course, there are some tools uh, we can use. Uh, uh, as Jenny mentioned, uh, the 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 the, the Fener calf inferior measurement uh, is easy to use, but also the bioimpedance. I think the bioimpedance is a new tool when it's available. Uh, it helps you uh, over time uh, with repeated measurements, uh, repeated uh, measurements, which can be done by the dialysis nurse because a very easy uh, tool uh, to use. And when you use it over time, you can see direction of the fluid states of of, the, of hydration status and ECW. And we know from, from different studies also done by our group that uh, either uh, fluid uh, depletion, but uh, pre-dialysis, but fluid de depletion also pre-dialysis can have a significant effect on, on mortality. Uh, okay. so I think, yes, there are tools that can be used uh, for optimizing a uh, dry weight, but what optimal dry weight is, I think we still don't, uh, we still don't know. It means the holy grail of dialysis, isn't it? Uh, it is, yes, it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me let me move on to uh, Mehmet here. There's another question here on uh, volume status evaluation methods. Now, Jennifer's already covered a lot of these methodology around it and some of the pitfalls and the strengths of them. What would be your advice and a bedside for a practicing dialysis physician to use in terms of methods to assess volume status in a in a in a in, a, in brief saying if there was a practical advice you were giving to your trainee, what would be your advice? You're on mute, Mehmet. Can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you, Jenny, for your excellent talk. Uh, yes, actually, there is no widely available uh, precise method for evaluating excess cellular volume. In general practice, uh, although we have many new technological methods, uh, tools that we have, like lung ultrasound, bioimpedance, or interferon vena cover collapsing measurement, we generally use clinical evaluation of patient. Uh, actually, I recommend to uh, evaluate, assess our patients once in a month uh, uh, by checking his uh, monitoring weight, blood pressure, ultrafiltration tolerance, and also by examining his lung and whether existence of edema might help us uh, for evaluating his volume status. Okay. So yeah. in ge generally, I recommend to examine our patients regularly. Great. Yes. Yeah. So so there's no substitute to clinical examination, but supplement it with your tools of evaluation, depending on what is available to you. But you need to understand your technology is what he's saying. So let me just uh, so lots of questions coming in and really interesting questions. So I don't want I want to sort of spend the time trying to address as many questions as possible. Um, so. I want to turn to Jenny for now. Um, Jennifer, there's a question on how to manage ultrafiltration in high volumes in patients who've got compromised cardiac function and low blood pressure, for example. That's a real conundrum on a day-to-day -day clinical practice. Give us some tips and advice and direction of how do we prescribe ultrafiltration in these patients in a safe manner. Sure, I, I will answer that, but I, I do, we, we've left out one piece of technology that I think is probably worth mentioning because it, it's often more available than some of the newer ones, which are the blood volume monitors. Um, and, and 
I mentioned them because it's what we have in our units. And I do think that there are ways, um, they have not been studied in the way that I find them helpful for volume management. Um, you know, I think that when they came into being, we thought of it as a tool to help us identify someone who was gonna have an episode of intradialytic hypotension. I don't use them that way at all. Um, I mean, if it's a patient that I know really well, the slopes are useful, but for the most part, if you would just let me see their blood volume monitor at the end of their treatment over um, a couple times a month, that that would be helpful. And so what I use them for is if a patient has been running a flat, a flat blood volume monitor for a week or so, that's a patient who the next week I will then ask the nurses to challenge their volume status. So again, the idea of not necessarily using them in real time, but using them to inform um, patients that you might wanna challenge volume status. So I just, I didn't wanna leave that out because I do think that that's an available tool to some people. But back to this question of managing ultrafiltration um, in patients with poor cardiac status. So this is, this is a problem for everyone and there, there's no good answer. Um, you know, you may give these patients midodrine, um, but I, I tend to find if I'm prescribing midodrine that we are, we are heading down a path that it's not going to end well because ultimately you're, you're just kind of plugging a hole then the dam is gonna break eventually. Um, so I do think in some cases that midodrine can be helpful. The way that I prescribe it is I will have a patient take it in the waiting room before they come onto treatment and bring an additional tablet that they take um, about an hour or two hours into treatment, depending on the duration of their treatment. I find that helpful, but again, I don't think that the impact on actual long-term outcomes is, is probably very much, but it might be, get you through some treatments with a little bit less intradialytic hypotension. Um, so that's midodrine. The other thing is just slower, more frequent dialysis. Um, and I have seen a number of patients who we have actually been able to improve their ejection fraction over time, but it's been by increasing the frequency of dialysis, so putting them on four or five times a week dialysis. Um, ideally, you would send these patients home and put them on PD and not even be discussing HD, but in, you know, in many cases, we can't do this. And so when you're, when you're left at HD, um, the more frequent that you can do it, the better. And so we certainly do have a number of patients that we... Um, through kind of um, documentation are able to dialyze four or five times a week to get the fluid off. But there are just some patients that there's no way that you're gonna be able to do it without extending time. Yeah, thank you for that. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a very useful thought because um, um, the blood volume linked to low, um, to compromised cardiac function could actually be quite real because the blood volume often tells, and I find it very useful, is it tells us how sharply the blood volume is dropping in that patient. And if you're able to dialyze these patients without massive shifts in blood volume, you may achieve the ultrafiltration volume. So it gives you a good indication of what's going on in the intravascular system. Because otherwise, blood pressure isn't the best. It's, it's probably the end point rather than the measure itself, process itself. So you, that, that link of blood volume and also managing them with frequency and slowly stripping the fluid of might be quite helpful. I've got lots of questions flying in here. So this is going to be rapid fire round. You give us quick answers for these questions. So I want to, um, uh, again, on the question of high intradiuretic weight gains, I think Jennifer has answered some of the questions, but Frank, what's your thought on having, dealing with these patients, some of them who have very large intradiuretic weight gains, quick tips on how we can address this problem with the patient. Well, I think Jenny already mentioned it, frequent dialysis. There could be an option, uh, uh, of course, looking at dietary intake, uh, the use of high sodium intake uh, in the patient. Uh, and if possible, if not possible dialysis, change them to another therapy, like, like putting on dialysis, or something like that, or nocturnal dialysis. Yeah, so using time, using frequency, using discussion engagement with the patient. Mm -hmm. Yes. It bring them on board, isn't it? Engaging the patient can be- Absolutely, the yeah. yeah, I do agree, yeah. Uh, otherwise you're hitting against a brick wall. So spend time with the patient, I guess, uh, as well as those maneuvers you're talking about. Um, um, Jennifer, what's the risk of high dose diuretics in HD patients? You mentioned the trial. Um, how is there any risk of using high dose diuretics, presumably in patients who have residual renal function, and how high can a dose be reasonably given for how long is a question. Can I pose that to you, please, Jennifer? You can. The short answer is, is we don't know the answer to that. I think that we will all on the panel have different clinical experience with it. Um, I mean, what we will 
tell you is, I mean, the concern is ototoxicity, I think is, is the highest level concern with it. Um, and when you get into the case reports and you get into the literature on this, most cases of ototoxicity occur at very high levels, tends to be IV dosing of diuretics. Um, but it is possible and there are reports at, at lower doses. And so I can tell you, and that's a lot of the reason that we're doing this, this pilot study that we're doing now. Um, and so the maximum dose that we're going up to is a total of 320 milligrams a day or 160 BID. And then the United States, this is kind of an eye popping uh, dose because it's, it's much higher than we typically see in clinical practice. I understand that you use even higher doses in Europe. Um, and I can tell you that we have had a couple of patients that have developed tinnitus. We have had one patient who actually did develop ototoxicity that we believe was possibly related to the furosemide. Um, so I think that you can truly see these side effects at different doses and you just have to monitor the patients. Um, in most cases, it's reversible. It's not always reversible. And so if you are using a high dose diuretic, it's just following up with the patient. Number one, is it working? I mean, there's no point in giving someone 320 milligrams of Lasix a day unless you're objectively increasing their urine volume. And what I can tell you is that we're seeing huge variation in this study about whether or not that it's effective. And so I would say use them as a time limited trial, actually measure the volume response. And if you're not getting it, you got to dial it back um, because I do think that there's some real, real safety concerns. Um, so it, I, I think it, from my personal experience, I would be a bit uncomfortable above about 320 a day, but I do understand that some people use higher doses. Yeah, okay. And uh, just measuring the volume, how do you do it? Is it a 24 hour interdialectic, 48 hour? What is your recommendation of what to do? Well, I mean, that's a good question as well. I mean, it, it tends to be what the patient will <laughs> agree to do. Um, in this particular study, we've done 24 hour urines and the patients have been quite amenable to doing them but you're gonna see huge variation in that. And even just talking to the patient, they'll say, you know, some days typically on their non-dialysis days, they tend to have more, you know, volume production than they do on, on their dialysis days, probably because of the ischemia that they're seeing um, with, on their hemodialysis treatment days. Um, so I think in the, the best case, you would do a treatment to treatment full 48 hour collection, but that's unlikely to happen in practice. Yeah. So I would say a 24 hour collection. But the, the one other comment I would make on that is there is data to suggest that just asking patients to self-report their urine volume is useful. And so there have been studies that have shown that literally if a patient will just tell you, I make a cup of urine a day and don't define a cup, that those patients tend to have better uh, outcomes and better control of their volume status. And so I think just asking patients um, can actually be quite instructive and that we don't have to get quite so caught up in the, the measurement. Great, thank you. Moving on, lots of questions. So uh, Mehmet, there are a couple of questions I want you to um, take if possible. Um, a good question here is, is isolated ultrafiltration still an option in managing volume in patients? What is your practice and what do you recommend? As Jenny mentioned, if we not be able to control uh, volume with three dialysis session, it might be better to give another chance for dialysis uh, for volume control. Uh, in such a in, in patient with uh, that new uncontrolled volume, we sometimes uh, order isolated high ultrafiltration to control volume. Yes, we do in general practice. Okay, so so essentially what you're saying is it's a useful manual for those extra sessions of dialysis that you want to yeah. do. And some all over and above your usual dialysis, don't replace it with your standard dialysis treatment because then you're compromising solid clearance. But all the extra treatments that, uh, that Jennifer was mentioning, you can, in discussion with the patient, consider how you deliver that. It could be an extra dialysis, it could be extra ultrafiltration isolated or, or whatever. And I, sometimes it gives you a bit more stable blood pressure because you're not minimizing urea and things, you know, the osmotic balance is not changing that much. Great. Uh, there is a question on dialysate flow um, in an edematous patient with low blood pressure, but I don't think there is any evidence of increasing dialysate flow as an intervention, uh, is there? So I think that's a fairly easy one to answer. Uh, it focus on the blood circuit and the ultrafiltration side rather than the dialysate side when you're thinking about uh, volume and blood pressure. Of course, the sodium content of the dialysate flow is important, which you've heard a lot of evidence and practice importance around it. Going back to technology, bioimpedance is back on the questions here. How often should we do bioimpedance? Before each session, once a week, 
what is your practice? Uh, Frank, what is your practice on bioimpedance? Uh, yes, we, 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 the, in all our patients, it's performed uh, once a month. Uh, well, mostly, once a month, mostly before or after the analysis. It doesn't make that much difference uh, because it, it, the, the bioimpedance gives you also information uh, on fluid status after the analysis. Uh, there are things, so some interesting data from Peter Wabel published a few years ago. Optimizing uh, dry weight is the use of my impedance. He measured every week my impedance uh, and adjust dry weight according to the results of the my I think in a patient who starts, yes, you can use it every week. A still patient might find it use it once a month. Okay. So, so again, you're getting some advice on how to buy impedance possibly every month. So, you, yeah. and dry weight assessment every month. You've heard about the fluid manager role, which is very interesting that Jennifer's mm -hmm. mentioned. You know, so so the, the 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 frequency is important, the timeliness is important, but not to an extent that jeopardizes or interferes with day-to-day -day running of the unit to an extent. So it's your call, but that's the sort of recommendation coming through, coming through. Um, and on the technology, um, is there an impedance module? There's a question on usefulness impedance module on the bioimpedance device, Frank. Your thoughts on the impedance module? Is this an important aspect of what you use when you're doing bioimpedance measure? What is it you're looking for in the bioimpedance? Uh, in the bioimpedance, we look at uh, fluid status pre and post analysis, but also on the, the, the fat mass and the lean tissue mass. Okay. And of course, for research purposes, uh, the data that is defined. Uh, I think for petrol use, the, 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 the flu amount of fluid. Uh, Overdrain be imposed uh, is useful for, for clinical practice. Uh. Okay, great, thank you. And, and uh, Jennifer, can I come back to you? Just one of the technical questions that has come through on bioimpedance phase angle. Uh, we get that reading often when we are doing bioimpedance. Can you just briefly tell us the importance of phase angle and what does the literature say on it in, in dry weight? Yeah, so the, the phase angle is one of the I would call it a raw bioimpedance data point as opposed to um, some of the ones that are kind of calculated based on the measurements. Um, and it's been used particularly um, to, as a surrogate or as a measure of nutritional status. Um, but the idea is it's an index of, um, of the ratio between extracellular and intracellular water. Um, it gives you information about um, the body's cell mass and also cellular integrity. Um, and so it's formed by the reactants and the resistance, and it's kind of the angle in between. Um, and it correlates with muscle mass, it correlates with muscle strength and frailty scales, um, and it also correlates with nutritional status. And I think one of the reasons that it's attractive is that um, there do seem to be the expected differences that you would see by both sex and body size. Um, so it may, um, be instructive in that way. Um, in dialysis patients, um, I do believe that it correlates with, with nutritional status. Um, it's not used as commonly in practice for volume measurement, but there is suggestion that it, it may be useful. Great, thank you. So uh, just a, a last couple of questions. Uh, from, uh, just to remind the audience, please stay on. As we come to the end of the seminar, we'll have a couple of more questions. But at the end, please stay on for another minute uh, if to, to fill in a short feedback survey. Please don't leave as soon as the meeting ends. So we really would value your feedback on that. Uh, one question here uh, is for Jennifer again. Uh, I think you've talked about lung ultrasound, comets, lung comets. The question here is, do you suggest that that is included in nephrology training? You mentioned the lack of standardization and operator dependence. What is your take on nephrology training, taking this on board? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think to answer the, the question fairly, we have to look at the existing evidence base. And I, I think that the existing evidence base is suggestive that it may be helpful, I think particularly helpful in acute environments. I mean, we use it, and I'm doing a small trial of it now in our hospital among patients whose, whose volume status might be, might be changing or you might miss um, a change in volume status. But in terms of 
large-scale randomized control trial evidence on long ultrasound, we don't have it. Now, the LUST trial, which is a, a well-known large multicenter uh, international trial, should report out very soon um, where they were able to look at heart outcomes. I'm certainly sure there's some people in the seminar who may have participated in that trial. And so hopefully um, in the next six months or so, we'll have answers from that that, that may be helpful. Um, but I do think that we should be training our, our trainees to do this, particularly if they're going to be practicing in a hospital environment. I think you're seeing it more and more, and it should be a part of nephrology. I just don't necessarily think we have the, uh, the evidence to tell the dialysis organizations or dialysis providers that they need to be providing lung ultrasounds to all outpatient clinics. Great, yeah. Maybe we need to get patients involved in talking about the importance of these things in their lives of trying to manage fluid balance. So great questions coming in. Um, uh, we're going to have to try and uh, move towards the end of the session, I'm afraid. Um, you've been a great audience. And, and uh, um, what I've heard is, is really some important pearls of practice here to take away. Um, and the three key words I've learned from, from, from all of you three talking about management is individualize. I heard a lot of that. So try and individualize the patients, stratify your management to them. A word that was, I think Jennifer mentioned, longitudinal trend, so important. Don't just rely on one figure. Look back on the past few, figures, few date points. To, to infer. And of course, another thing that was mentioned was close vigilance. Close vigilance, adjustment to target weight um, is, is, is all that you need. Don't need all fancy signs necessarily, but it's great to see some you know, RCTs evolving in this area as well. Uh, that has been lacking in the last two, two decades. So, so this is a very active topic and such an important one for our patients. I have to thank our, panel, our panelists today for giving it, for answering so many questions and, and to you as audience for uh, being a great audience. Thank you so much. As, as always, please fill in your feedback survey. Uh, I'll draw the session to a close now. Thank you, everyone.